ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Carlos Neilbach, master metallurgist. All right. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Carlos Neilbach, and I'm so privileged uh, to tell you about my story, which starts with my dad, who um, migrated from West Virginia and escaped uh, other poverty there and uh, migrated to Detroit and joined his brothers uh, looking for fame and fortune. And uh, he ended up joining the army, United States Army, uh, and um, he found himself on his way to Germany, which uh, America occupied after uh, World War II. And he was a black GI, real good looking, and um, full of energy, and I think he wanted to um, just, uh, um, you know, prove himself. And uh, he found himself with all those limitations that uh, pre-emancipation bear with him. He uh, was black bathrooms and white bathrooms and all those different things that different races have to do. And uh, he met my mother, which was a white woman, and they fell in love, and out came me. And uh, <laughs> the army didn't really like that so much, so they sent him back to the United States, and I stayed behind with my mother in Germany. And um, my mother, real good looking, too. So uh, um, as time went by, she met a fella who fell in love with her, and my dad was far away in the United States, and at that time it was made clear to both of them that that's not going to happen. Black people and white people don't mix and they don't have no kids. So um, my dad was um, sent to the Upper Peninsula, um, where there was an uh, Indian reservation close by, and he found another companion. And so I have another sister, she is Indian. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah. Uh, that's just on the side, but. Uh, so, so I grew up in Germany, all really charged, and uh, like I say, my mother fell in love again with a fellow named Heinz Nielbach and who adopted me, and he really realized that there's a hard time um, between an interracial kid growing up there in post-war Nazi Germany where all the people kind of looked the same, and they thought about themselves uh, in a certain kind of way. And I was... Um, made by, um, no, I was, um, I was protected by my dad. And actually, he was affluent in the city and they had a cabaret, a Moulin Rouge type of uh, establishment that was well known in the city, which everybody uh, frequent kind of. And he was uh, influential and made sure that I got a good education, that I was accepted in the schools, that I was um, part of the town life right there. I was um, part of the town militia, which was several hundred years old, which protected the old cellar town from Napoleon invasion and this sort of stuff, you know. So I was welcomed there as a member, full-fledged member, and uh, experience the, the cultural um, education that German young man of my stature and age just got. And I was, I was integrated by my dad. He made sure that I, uh, I was like um, uh, not harmed in any kind of way. And uh, 
So as I grew up and um, I kind of figured out that I'm not the 100% German person. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I saw on TV James Brown and Bob Marley and oh my God, and Muhammad Ali and all kind of other people that I identified kind of with them, kind of <laughs> liked <with> them. <laughs> and other people looked at me kind of at the, so, um, I, I, I uh, was really a handful. So, <laughs> so to, to get somewhat of an education that was geared towards my, um, to, towards me, I, I find myself in a monastery, a monastery that teaches young men. Uh, a skilled trade, and those monks, they was in that monastery, they was uh, exercising the skilled trades that you might find in a Catholic church, like stained glass windows and Bible binding and, you know, wood carving and just all kind of great skilled trades. They're hundreds of years old. They was passed on from one trades master to the next and so forth. And I immediately liked it, the guy who did the fire and the blacksmith and this sort of stuff. And I liked it, all the action, and I was on and, um, you know, tried to get that education. And, uh, but I wasn't really accepted by those trade master who really ruled this entire metal fabricating shop. He was an old guy with one eye and shoveled in and <laughs> people bowed to him and got him a chair and set him, put him his fire on and he just put in the raw material iron in the fire and made it hot and hammered around on it and out came the rows of beautiful ornaments and things like this and I wanted to do that and, but uh, the skilled trades is like a privileged type of thing that when the trade master likes you, then he passed that kind of on to you. He favors you and he pass on all that knowledge to you, but I wasn't the candidate. So I kind of <laughs> looked at what they was doing and when they told me to clean up the shop after it was done, I yeah. took the fire, up, made it back on and I monkeyed up exactly the same thing with this stuff. And, Little by little, I became good in it, and so after a few tries and errors, I uh, became the jobs, you know, just give it to Carl, he, you know, and so I uh, graduated and I got this really good education as a um, blacksmith, and after that, I joined the national uh, service in Germany. Every young man has to go, and after that, I really wanted to only be in business for myself. From what I saw from my stepdad, Heinz Nielbach, he had uh, employees and money and all this kind of stuff, and I wanted that. But uh, I had the skilled traits, and so, of course, I had to be in business for myself. And, um, but that wasn't really possible, because in Germany, you have to be a skilled tradesman for a long time and belong to those guilds that, you know, doing all those rituals for a long time and all this stuff. And um, that was all too long for me. And they really told me that it was no way that I'm working on the castle or on this church or any, you know. And so I opened up my own business, Kunsthandwerkstatt Nielbach. Uh, this is Art, just what my thing is do right now is um, hand, uh, can art hand works, uh, just translated. And uh, I, um, I uh, got a few jobs and was independent and I felt good. And um, some way, somehow I had to find my dad and I was really stagnant and it was not really that what I wanted to do. And, I remembered all my good buddies that I had in Germany that was British soldiers. These British soldiers came from Jamaica, and of course I wanted to go to Jamaica. But before Jamaica, I had to go to my dad and see if I can find out about my real dad 
here in Detroit City. So I went to a traveling agency and said, I gotta go to Jamaica, and first I gotta go to Detroit, find my dad. And they told me I gotta go to, <laughs> to New York, and from New York you catch a Greyhound, then you're gonna give, be in Detroit. And so, of course, uh, I end up in New York, and that was already great. I mean, like skyscrapers and all kind of people and so forth. And people had, uh, they kind of protected me. They said, oh, no, here's a Greyhound here. You gotta go set me in the bus so that I don't get lost. <laughs> so I end up here in Detroit, and you know, uh, the bus driver told the ticket person right there and said, look, this guy, you gotta watch him. Uh, he looking for his dad. <laughs> and I had a letter from Helen Street, they were on the east side of Detroit, right the east side. And the ticket person said, yeah, I got a brother, he's a cab driver and he drives you there. And before you know it, I was on Helen Street between Charlevoix and Vernon. <laughs> it was the house my dad owned, the address that I found and the house was abandoned, yeah. So I sat there and just get at myself, and I thought, maybe the neighbors know, you know. And before you know it, um, I uh, found the uncle, and the uncle had my cousins. I, um, there was my dad's brother, actually had two brothers living on the same block. And himself, uh, he utilized the house as a storage house. And he lived down the street with his girlfriend. <laughs> and so um, I get to know all this family and so many black people I never seen in my life. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> I kind of was like, you know, and they kind of looking at me like, kind of like cousin, you know, yes, yeah. And then, uh, so they fanned out and looked for my dad and about an hour later and after a lot of Kool-Aid and... <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, he walked in the door. He walked in the door and I'm standing there and, I'm like, <laughs> and, and he like, how long you stay? <laughs> you know? I like, I don't know, you know? <laughs> so so uh, he invited me to come to his girlfriend and they prepared already a room for me and I just settled in and I just said to myself, you're gonna stay here, you know? <laughs> 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 and so, so, so the next day, um, you know, they show me around and I'm, I'm see Detroit for the first time and I'm seeing all those skyscrapers and houses and Cadillacs and Lincolns and oh my God. So, uh, me from a little town, you know, 65,000 people and a lot of cows around and just nothing like this right here. And um, I had this little uh, workshop in Germany, my little art studio and pictures, and I showed everybody, look what I'm doing. I'm, you know, I'm good with my hands, I do this metal work, and uh, people say, yeah, that's nice, uh, but, but nobody buy this here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you got to go to Hollywood where the rich people are. <laughs> so, um, I end up to drive to Hollywood, you know, <laughs> and that's where I learned um, English and um, I learned, you know, America and it was really strenuous on me to the point that I, after a year, I had to, I want to just go home, you know? <laughs> and I want to admit defeat, and I just wanted to go home, and um, I, w I called the consulate, and I said, I can't do it no more. I, I overstayed my visa, and I gotta go. <laughs> I gotta go back home and say, okay, 
you know, you gotta go from Detroit because that's where you came. So from California back to Detroit with the Greyhound took a few days. Uh, and when I arrived in Detroit, I was really, um, it was at nighttime, I was tired and I had nowhere to go and it was just the house on Helen Street where nobody was and I just got there and got in there and found a room and next morning I was gone in any which way so uh, fell asleep and in the morning I heard birds, like birds, like beautiful birds. And I opened my eyes and looked out the window. There was this almost a, a garden like in a paradise, you know, uh, roses and fragrance and birds and little, little colored windmills that spin around and I mean like things like unbelievable, like Tyree Garden kind of, you know, but more brilliant. And um, that was my dad's private garden that he um, put together uh, of his memory of his travels when he was in Algier and Germany and saw this castle and this castle and the rose garden and here and there. And he just made himself a little world, you know, and I woke up there and I looked around and looked around some more, and before you know it, I just threw my ticket away. I just <laughs> got new courage. And um, I, um, I, w I really wanted to try it one more time. And, you know, I, I, I took already so much time, but, you know, I, I'm trying to, from that, from that point on, I, I'm trying to understand my dad, I, I learned the language, I trying to understand how come he never came back to, um, you know, look for me or, and the more I try to understand him and I try him to understand me, um, there was just no connection kind of, the connection wasn't there and I some kind of way made my mind up like this is my dad and you came all the way from here and you know I got a, got a ring through him some kind of way and I made my mind up at that point really I do everything to be a good son to him so he have to like me you know there's just no other way I want to be so such a good son that he just just have to like me so um you know, I've, I'm just told him, I say, look, I'll stay here, I'm gonna be a good son to you. You know, he say, okay, well, you gotta get a job with the city, you know, <laughs> you gotta get a job. I say, no, no, really, I'm, uh, you know, businessman, entrepreneur. <laughs> you know? So how much is this gonna pay? You know? So <laughs> it took three years, me staying in this house right there against his will, you know, trying to convince him that that not going to work nine to five is really the way to go. <laughs> and and, um, and and why I'm trying to do this? I'm I'm trying to go to school and I'm trying to get some kind of degree in fine arts or some kind of handle on how to make money and how to be a man and how to do stuff and he would be hustling and working his job and have money and doing all kind of stuff. And um, so I'm trying to go to this school and some way somehow I never could go to school. There's, there's no money for tuition or I, I went with my cousins, you know, my, all my cousins came with me and so, said, yeah, this, you want to go to school and, but it, 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 it didn't came about. And, SBA. I, th I thought somebody must have an interest for you to be a millionaire, uh, you know, <laughs> just like that. But uh, and true enough, there was a SBA, Small Business Administration. They want you to be a millionaire so you can pay taxes. For it, you know, so so SBA really turned me on to business, on how to do business with the federal government, on how you have to situate yourself so you can. 
you know, sell your goods or your service, and how do we get your house in order and all this kind of stuff. And I did that. You know, I, I ironed my shirts and I put my suit on and right from hell and I stand on the bus and all this kind of stuff. And before you know it, you know, I graduate at this 8A program and I got a sense on how to do business before I even talk English right. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, together with the ability that, I, that those monks there in Germany taught me, um, I just, the first opportunity of any restoration that happened in Detroit was the restoration of the Fox Theater. And when I heard about that, and it was big programmed, I put my suit back on and just walked straight to the trailer, to the building trailer there, construction trailer. And I told him, my name is Carlos Nierberg from Germany, and I'm here to take care of all of your metal needs. <laughs> You know. So uh, the guys was really busy there, and he just pointed me to a pile of drawings, like over there, the drawings, right? So I could read them all. It was written in German, some was written in German. I could read the blueprints, and I knew exactly what, what's going on right there. And it really led to a substantial contract that in interim uh, gave me enough finances to restore the house that my dad had to the point that how, when it was originally built, the floor sanded, the moldings done, everything. And I built a workshop in the backyard, uh, like, you know, my studio. And I operated out of there for 15 to 20 years. And, I made so much business out of it and grow so much out of it. You know, uh, I gotta say thank you to all my neighbors too because I was welding and doing blacksmithing in the middle of a block, a uh, residential area, <laughs> grinding in a two o'clock at nighttime and uh, you know, blue light coming out of all of my <laughs> windows. So, <laughs> so I outgrew that and I, found another building on Eastern Market, and I was able to do the same thing. I was apply my skill trades, bought the building for cheap, and restored it with my own hands and with the help of my buddies, and, and um, you know, was able to grow my business. And, you know, my son, he do the same thing that I do. You know, I'm, we had many conversations, and oh, I don't do this, and you got to listen, and all this kind of stuff. But at the end, he do what I do, you know. <laughs> my daughter right there, uh, the youngest daughter, she is my business administrator. I don't even know how to sign a check or anything. You know, she really steered my whole thing around. Everybody been through the rough times since 2012, I have to tell you. And my other daughter, she made me a proud granddaddy. So I'm a granddaddy now. My father's a great granddaddy. <laughs> and, um, you know, he's getting old now and he can't drive no more. But I know he is just a happy man looking back and kind of that's my story. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Neil Bach.